Good afternoon. Welcome to the Family Research Council. We're pleased to have you here today and uh, very pleased to have our guest, Dr. Michael Brown. Dr. Brown is the author of 25 books, most recently, Can You Be Gay and Christian, which is the topic of today's lecture. He hosts the nationally syndicated talk radio show, The Line of Fire, and is a recognized cultural commentator. He holds a PhD in Near Eastern Languages and Literatures from New York University and serves as a visiting or adjunct professor at a number of top seminaries. I know the um, discussion today will be uh, one of interest to many people. I also would like to welcome our, our online audience. Several hundred will be watching us online as well. If you have a question, please hold it till the end of the lecture. And uh, with the time remaining, we'll have a microphone that goes around that will allow uh, both the people in the room and our online audience to, uh, to hear your question. And uh, without further ado, Dr. Brown. Uh, well, it is, is really great to be here in more ways than one. It's simply great to be here, period. I had 27 hours of airport delays, flight cancellations, ended up stuck in Chicago, and f got there yesterday morning to try to resume a trip back here after missing another event I was supposed to be speaking at, and uh, got to the airport at 11 in the morning, and left the airport at 11.30 at night, was supposed to arrive here at four in the afternoon, got to my hotel at three in the morning, also without luggage for the second day. So thanks to Anna at Macy's, I have a new wardrobe here. And since they do not have a big and tall men's shop, we did the best we could. And uh, so I'm glad to be here, period. Um, the, the subject for today is, is a critically important one and it's, it's one that we, we can't avoid. And I, I just want to illustrate this for you in a short video that I prepared for the publisher of my book, Can You Be Gay and Christian? Because when I first got involved in issues having to do with homosexual activism, it was a lot of stuff happening in society. It was a gay pride event in the city of Charlotte uh, where we had just moved in 2003 and we were shocked at the public displays and the lewdness and vulgarity at the event. It would have been horrific if it was heterosexual. But over the years, what we're hearing more and more about is those who identify as gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, who want to please the Lord and serve the Lord and say that, that God's made them the way they are. They're not the ones that are, that are doing vulgar things at a gay pride event or something like that. And I, I, I participated in a talk one time at a local college with a number of other guests and there was a man there who was older than me, taller than me. He was wearing a wig, a blouse with a bra, a skirt. He identified himself as Roberta with a deep voice and he had a bone to pick with me because when I had debated gay activist Harry Knox, who's a professing born-again Christian, uh, neither of us opened in prayer, and this gentleman identified as Roberta was offended by that, and he introduced himself as holding to the infallibility of Scripture and to the right of Rush Limbaugh politically. So these issues now have taken on a, a whole new dimension. I had lunch years ago with the editor of Q Notes back then, the gay newspaper of the Carolinas, and he was a professing atheist, and he said for years in the big cities, all the gay men he knew were atheists. Now that he had moved to the South, everywhere he's turning, there are, quote, gay Christians. And at the gay pride events now, you'll have ministers praying publicly and, and welcoming people in Jesus' name. So these are issues that, that we must look at. And they're sensitive issues because we're talking about people's lives. We're not just talking about statistics. We're talking about people's lives. So let me just illustrate things for you with this brief video so that you can get a feel for what we're dealing with in terms of the literature and what's actually out there. Go ahead. Oh, I'm not talking about somebody that's at a gay pride event and they're parading around in their underwear and showing off their sexuality. I'm, I'm talking about a couple, two guys. I mean, they, they love Jesus. They say they do. They love the word of God and they study the scriptures together. They just happen to be gay and they're in relationship together or, or, or two lesbians who love Jesus. Who, who are we to tell them that God says you can't be gay and Christian? You know, Bishop Gene Robinson wrote a book endorsed by the president of the United States, said just love. God believes in love. And 
Some people say that the Christian message that we preach in our fundamentalist church, it means hate your neighbor. And, and someone else, boy, he's a, a PhD. He says that what we're telling people is thou shalt not love. And some are saying, you're Pharisees. You're just a bunch of Pharisees. And, and here's a gay theologian. He says, it's just a matter of radical love. That's all we're talking about. Here's a book written for gay Christians, how they can survive and have bulletproof faith. And whoa, I, I've got here a study New Testament for lesbians, gays, and bisexuals, and, and, and queer commentary in the Hebrew Bible. And, and th this is the, the queer Bible commentary. And oh, I, I've, I've got a book here just about all the horrific experiences that people go through because of what the church teaches. And, and here's a pastor saying, explode the myths that you're wrong things you're teaching about Jesus and homosexuality. And another pastor saying, it's, it's time to embrace. And, and here, the books, books by, by people saying, look, I love Jesus. Uh, holy homosexuals. Look at this, holy homosexuals. And, and, and all these other books with what the Bible really says and, and you know, I know it's confusing, I know it's overwhelming at times, but I wrote a book, Can You Be Gay and Christian? You know what I did? I went back to the Bible with love, with a heart of compassion, without a judgmental spirit. I went back to the Bible to answer, well, what does Jesus really say about this? What does Paul really say about this? What about the prohibitions in the book of Leviticus? What about the law of love, love your neighbor as yourself? Where do we come out with this? Can you be gay and Christian? This book, written with grace, written with truth, will break your heart with the truth of God and help you to minister with grace and truth to those who identify as gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender. Can you be gay and Christian? Read the book and find out. Well, it, it, it just so happens that, that my book, Can You Be Gay and Christian, came out a couple of weeks after the Matthew Vines book, God and the Gay Christian, that's been getting a lot of attention. His video talk went viral a couple years back, and we didn't time it like this. It just worked out for my book to come out about the same time as his, but that's excellent because it allows people to really dive into the issues together. I, I want to give you an overview of how I've approached this and, and what I hope will be practical thoughts for you on this question of can you be gay and Christian. When I began dealing with issues of homosexual activism about 10 years ago, the principle that I followed was reach out and resist. Reach out to the people with compassion, resist the agenda with courage. Reach out and resist. Now, once you stand against the goals of homosexual activism in society, once you stand against redefining marriage or normalizing homosexuality, or you stand against teaching certain things in the schools, or you stand up for religious freedoms and freedom of conscience and speech, you'll immediately be branded hateful, bigoted, homophobic, etc. And in order to, to interact with people on an individual level, it has to be individual. In other words, the moment you take a stand against any of these issues, the moment you say, hey, I was watching sports the other day. I was not interested in seeing a homosexual kiss on the NFL draft. I wasn't looking for that. I wasn't looking for that in the headlines of the newspaper. Like one fellow said to me, I was out with my little son at the restaurant. We, I was not what I was wanted to talk about when there it is on the TV screens in, in the restaurant. These things are just coming our way. California's just passed a bill in the assembly that lesbian mothers can be designated as father on the birth certificate and, and gay men can be designated as mother. Uh, England has said that we're now going to overrule hundreds of years or thousands of years of usage, but hundreds of years in English and the Oxford English Dictionary and now say that a woman can be a husband and a man can be a wife. And on and on it goes. These things are everywhere around us. So once you address them, you'll be branded as hateful, homophobic. However, we're still living in this world I fly all the time, I'm talking to people, we can relate one-on-one, -on -one. we can interact. And in one long flight I had, as soon as we sat down on the way to Rome, the fellow next to me immediately was out and proud and said, I'm going over to Rome, I've got, I'm a flight attendant, I've got a day off, I'm going over there to meet my partner, began to immediately proclaim himself out and proud. So I did the same, I said, I'm a follower of Jesus, I believe in the authority of scripture, I differ with you on this and this, and we had a tremendous talk. I sat in tears as he shared some of his life experience, and at the end of the flight, I said to him, I said, 
if you met someone who held to my values, would you consider that person homophobic? He said, absolutely. I said, do you consider me homophobic? He said, no, because I heard your heart. And he said, it's delightful to talk to a conservative with a heart. That was his perception. Um, the good thing about this book, Can You Be Gay and Christian, is you'll hear my heart on every page. And one of the things that I wanted to do in writing the book was help believing Christians and help evangelical Christians and those who hold to the authority of scripture recognize the unique struggles that are faced by those who identify as LGBT and who want to please the Lord. Some grew up feeling that God hated them or there was something wrong with them. Some grew up feeling that they could never possibly serve God because they were somehow under God's condemnation. A, a caller to my radio show explained, and we, we first met through social media, interacted, that he thought he was given over to a reprobate mind. Here is a man that is in advanced stages of HIV. His last lover killed himself. Uh, he's wanted to follow the Lord. He went through uh, counseling. He went through to ex-gay groups. He even had shock treatment. The poor guy, you, you hear a story, you want to weep. And he wrote to me, he said, I believe homosexual practice is wrong. I think God's given me over to a reprobate mind. And we were able to minister to him, and, and he, he found assurance in the Lord and, and, and wept over it. But, but I can't imagine what some have struggled with. Or then you've got some 18-year-old, you're sharing the gospel with that person, and, and maybe he's same-sex attracted, and he's saying, are you telling me that if I want to follow Jesus, I can never have a relationship? Or I'm going to have to struggle to try to overcome these attractions for, for decades? Is that what you're telling me? You're telling me I can never marry? These, these are weighty issues. And then, of course, we're always reminded about kids who, who hear hate-mongering rhetoric and then kill themselves. And, and I've been told many times, the blood of gay young people is on your hands. And I tell them the message of Jesus is a message of life and hope and that delivers from suicide and delivers from depression. Nonetheless, these are the types of things that you have to deal with. An immediate answer to the question, can you be gay and Christian? And even in saying that, I'm using terms advisedly for the sake of conversation and dialogue. We could discuss what's meant by gay identity and do we even want to use certain terms or buy into a certain mindset. But to speak in today's parlance, can you be gay and Christian? If by that you mean, can you be same-sex attracted, recognize those attractions are wrong, renounce them, not act on them, and follow Jesus? Of, of course. As one former lesbian said in, in a meeting, God never said, be thou heterosexual, for I, the Lord thy God, am heterosexual, but be thou holy, for I, the Lord thy God, am holy. We often put the emphasis on the wrong thing. And instead of helping someone really come to know Jesus and then grow as a disciple in holiness and purity and, and, and in devotion to the Lord, we put the emphasis on becoming heterosexual, which, which is not where the emphasis should be. If by can you be gay and Christian, you mean can you be a practicing homosexual and follow Jesus at the same time? Of course not. Scripture is explicit about this, and this is what we need to understand. With all of the literature that's been written in recent decades, with novel interpretations that have never been seen in the history of biblical interpretation until after the sexual revolution of the 60s, which should tell you something. With, with all of this, there is actually no new information. In other words, there is not a scrap of textual or archeological or linguistic or interpretive data in any way that has been discovered that should overturn our historic understanding of scripture. Not a shred of it. In fact, the main thing that we're told is that we now understand human sexuality better. We now understand sexual orientation. And these were concepts that the biblical authors did not have before them, which even if that were true, that would mean that until this last generation or so, that everyone reading the Bible would absolutely misunderstand it and that God did not take that into account when he inspired the scriptures. That as the scriptures were inspired and given, it meant that gays, lesbians, and others who identified as such or who were same-sex attracted through the centuries, or in some cases, going back to Old Testament, through the millennia, would be wrongly treated, discriminated against, or even under Old Testament law, stoned to death simply because of a lack of scientific understanding. That is stretching things. So where, where do we start? Well, we do need to start in the beginning. 
we do need to start in Genesis 1 and recognize that at creation, God made us male and female. The foundation of all foundations is that God exists. The next foundation of all foundations is that he created the universe. And the next foundation is the pinnacle of, the, of his creation is the human race, and he makes us male and female. There are distinctives in that. There, there is a unique expression of the fullness of God's character in male and female. And then in Genesis, the second chapter, we read that the, the woman literally is taken out of the man, even if someone wanted to read that figuratively and not biologically. The fact is, in Hebrew, she's called Isha because she's taken out of the Ish. She's called woman because she's taken out of the man. That's why when the two come back together, you see, this is the concept. Originally, God created Adam, humankind, as male and female in one. And then there was a separation of the two to have man and woman. And that's why the man and woman now come together as one. It's clear, of course, we come together as one. We're biologically designed for that. There is also a unique emotional and spiritual complementarity. There's the, the famous book series, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From, v from Venus. And I haven't read the books, I just know the title. And I can deduce this, that Mars plus Mars, or Venus plus Venus, does not equal Mars plus Venus. There is something unique about the two coming together because they were separated and now rejoined as one. The two become one, and these are the only ones who can fulfill the biblical mandate to be fruitful and multiply. Now, now we are often told that there are just six principal passages called the clobber passages, and these passages are the things that have been used to beat homosexual men and women over the head through the centuries and to tell them that they're, they're of a lower class or caste or rejected by God by their very nature. What we need to do, though, is step back and understand a few fundamental things. God creating us male and female is the foundation. And the Bible presupposes and ordains heterosexuality as the only acceptable norm from beginning to end, period. My friend Larry Tomzak uses this illustration. Let's say that you put together a cookbook and the cookbook is healthy desserts and instead of sugar, you use all types of natural substitutes. Now, that's a book I probably wouldn't buy. But anyway, let's just say you have this book. And in the introduction, the author says, in the recipes that follow, you will not find any sugar. I feel very strongly about not using sugar. Therefore, throughout this book, you'll find no references to sugar. We have other natural ingredients to use to sweeten these desserts instead of sugar. And then the rest of the book, there's not a single mention of, of sugar. Well, if you did a search on that book, let's say you had it in an ebook form and you did a search, you'd say, there are only five references to sugar in this book. It's obviously not a big deal to the author. They only mention it five times out of 100,000 words of recipes. No, to the contrary, because it's so fundamental, they do not need to say it over and over. It's the absence of it, which is the issue. What do I mean by that? From beginning to end, the only model, the only norm, the only example given on any level of a sanctioned relationship or a blessed relationship or a relationship that can fulfill God's plan is heterosexual. It, the Bible does not have to constantly speak against homosexual practice because it presupposes heterosexuality. Be fruitful and multiply, the command to the human race. And it doesn't mean that every couple has to procreate. It means that there are only some that are designed to. That's who God's speaking to. Children, obey your mother and father. That's, that doesn't work. When you're reading that, you may be a lesbian couple and you may really care for your kid. You may be, you may be a gay male couple, you may really care for your kid. But when your kid reads, honor your father and mother, well, who's the father, who's the mother? I'm not saying that to, to be mocking. I'm simply saying it's presupposing heterosexuality. Husbands love your wives. You're a gay couple reading this. Husbands love your wives. Wives submit to your husbands. Who's the husband? Who's the wife? It, it, everything does not fit. All of it does not fit any model except for heterosexuality. Every parable, every example given of marriage, every romance that's celebrated, it's all heterosexual. That's a foundation that we need to start with. 
And then when we look at the passages, the so-called clobber passages, we need to recognize, as I said a moment ago, there's no new data. There, there is nothing new on the subject that we, we suddenly discovered that all of our biblical texts are wrong. And now we have the original manuscripts and they all say something different. Of course, that's utterly ludicrous, but that hasn't happened. We have now made new linguistic and philological discoveries and now, we, no, 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 that hasn't happened. And something I find amusing personally is I'm frequently attacked by critics if I'm dealing with sociological issues and cultural issues. I'm constantly attacked by critics. Well, you don't have any educational background in that. Your PhD is in Semitic languages. Well, I have a simple question. So when I talk about Semitic languages in the Hebrew Bible, do you believe me then? No, because you're a bigot. <laughs> It's, it's kind of like by coming here to speak at FRC, I will be blasted for taking this invitation. At the same time, FRC will be blasted for having me. <laughs> let's, let's look at, at a number of specific issues. As I go through the book, again, from beginning to end, I try to sensitize people's hearts. You might think, man, who cares? That's just gross. That's an abomination. How can you even talk about it? Well, you need to hear it from the viewpoint of those who say, I love Jesus, I want to please the Lord, and I'm same-sex attracted. You need to hear about their struggles, their battles. And, and doing apologetics for years as a Jewish follower of Jesus, I've debated rabbis for years and have written a five-volume series responding to objections. And one key thing with apologetics is you really want to put yourself in the other person's shoes. You want to see the world through their eyes. You want to feel the weight of their objection. Otherwise, your responses are superficial. So I've read enough stuff that literally I had to put the book down and get alone in the room and cry because my heart went out so deep. Now, now, critics will mock that and say it never happened. God knows the tears that have been shed. God knows the pain in writing these pages to, to say, am I representing it rightly? Are, are people capturing the heart of this? Am I presenting the other arguments clearly so they can feel the weight as we do respond? And look, we can't fool people. Ultimately, people will know what's in our hearts. I remember when we lived on Long Island, there was an exotic bird store, all these parrots and macaws, these amazing birds. And I, I'd go in there with my wife, and she'd go up to one and would get right on, her, right on her finger immediately. And the guy that ran the place, he'd go up, grab any of them. I'd go over, and they'd immediately go to bite me. <laughs> I said, well, and, and, and Nancy, my wife, would say to me, they can tell you're afraid. I didn't look, I mean, I made sure I just, they'd go to bite me. The birds can tell. People can tell what's really in our hearts. And when we just have soundbite answers, when we just have our, our quick soundbite response, sometimes I think that we do it because we don't want our own views to be challenged. I'm writing a commentary on Job now and talking about some of the responses of the friends they just have to answer with theological orthodoxy because they cannot possibly have their worldview be challenged. I like to challenge it because I know there are solid answers. I, I like to challenge people with the other position. I love to have public debates and dialogues so people can hear both sides because I have absolutely no question. I'm 100% sure that the Bible forbids and prohibits homosexual practice. There may be people just discovering the Lord in the early stages of knowing him. One former lesbian who worked with Dr. Dobson's organization for some years talks about how she became a believer in Jesus while still in a lesbian relationship. And, and then over a period of time, God convicted her that she shouldn't be having sexual relations with her partner, but they slept in the same bed. Then over a period of time, God convicted her that that was wrong and the whole relationship had to be broken up. It took some time. God is the ultimate judge of every heart. But I'm happy to expose people to the fullness of the weight of the objection so they can feel it, they can wrestle with it, and then recognize the word of God is very clear. And even though you may have minor variations among translations, the overall sense is very, very clear. And it's no mystery why the, the major lexicons, Hebrew and Greek lexicons, written by the top language scholars in the world, some of whom are liberal, some of whom do not have the same view of scripture that most of us have, it's no mystery that they all understood these words to prohibit homosexual practice. And no one really questioned it on any serious lexical level until 
after the sexual revolution of the 60s. I find it interesting that in response to my book, which is absolutely the most compassionate, sensitively written piece that I've put out on this issue, not dealing with the activism in society, although I talk about that's the elephant in the room we can't ignore, but focusing on these biblical and personal issues, I find it interesting that the attacks on me from critics have been the harshest yet. As a result of writing a book which any reader will immediately see as compassionate and sensitive, I have been branded the new Fred Phelps. I mean, it's the exact opposite. Uh, the new Fred Phelps, what was it, who is a cult leader advocating human sacrifice. You think, what are people thinking? A, a guy called my show who had written a review saying that, just a reader, and I asked him if he was on medication. I thought, there's got to be an explanation for the irrationality. And I, I wasn't being, I was really being serious. Something is funny here. Something is not adding up. And why is that? Why the more compassionate, the more sensitive, the more gracious, why the uglier attack? And it's obvious because a nerve is being touched. It's obvious because there's a hypersensitivity in, in the lives of many. They've been rejected, they've been hated, they've been told there's something wrong with you. Just think of it, have you ever done a fast and you were struggling on the fast and part way through you rationalized why you should eat? And, and there's this wonderful sense of, I can eat and, and, and take a break from this fast. And years ago, Nancy told me to, to write down what God has laid on my heart, how long I'm supposed to fast before the fast. She said, because it tends to change once the fast is happening. <laughs> well, if we can do that with something as trivial as food, what about someone who's felt rejected all their spiritual life? What about someone who lived with a cloud over them thinking God must hate me or maybe he made me like this to condemn me? And then someone says, no, 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 you're misreading the Bible. No, 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 that's just talking about pederasty or that's just talking about prostitution or that was just cultural issues in Israel. No, no, the Bible has nothing negative to say about monogamous committed same-sex relationships. Think of that sense of relief you could get. Think of that sense of, oh, so I am okay with God. No, it's deception. But think of how powerful that is. Now let's put it in a larger context. The gospel in America today starts with me. This is how I feel, this is who I am, and God is here to make me feel better. Over 50 years ago, A.W. Tozer said that whereas the old cross killed the sinner, the new cross redirects the sinner. I've updated that. The modern cross doesn't redirect the sinner. The modern cross empowers the sinner. Jesus died to make me into a bigger and better me and to bring me self-fulfillment and the ability to, to live my life and dream my dreams. That's why Jesus came. It starts with me and God is here to please me. The biblical gospel starts with God. In fact, when Paul lays out the biblical gospel, starting in Romans, the first chapter, he starts with the wrath of God and the sinfulness of man and then justification by faith. The biblical gospel starts with God and then asks, what can we do to please him? What can we do to serve him and to live for him? The modern gospel starts with me and then what can God do to please me? Now, when you factor in the idea of gay identity, and I would say that is not a biblical concept in any way, and, and it is merely a, a contemporary, recent contemporary, hundred something years old construction, mindset. But if you start with that, this is who I am, I am same-sex attracted, or I am a man in a woman's body, or whatever it is, and these may be very, very deep-seated issues. These may be issues at the core of someone's being. And now you go to God, well, God must be here to somehow affirm me. Whereas the biblical call for all of us, Jesus says to all of us, deny yourself, take up the cross. That's where it starts. There's a pastor in England who is still same-sex attracted but renounces the attractions, does not cultivate them, feed into them, is celibate and serving the Lord and enjoying his relationship with God. And he said when people hear about his situation, they say to him, oh, this must be very hard for you. And he says, no. Now, this is him speaking. He can say this more powerfully than I can as a married heterosexual man. 
he says this, Jesus requires everything from all of us. And Jesus is enough for all of us. In other words, whoever we are, whatever our background, Jesus requires the same thing of all of us. As a Jewish follower of Jesus, I had to go against centuries of family tradition and be rejected in certain ways. I've been to India 21 straight years to minister. When we do water baptisms in India, my friend who was a former untouchable, now with an extraordinary ministry of humanitarian work and church planting in unreached areas, when he and I do the water baptisms, he asks the people, are you willing to follow Jesus, whether by life or death, to your last drop of breath? This is at water baptism because many will be persecuted and put out of their families and some killed. I have literally washed the feet of a martyr's widow in India. A few years earlier, we laid hands on her husband and set him out to preach. He was beaten to death by Hindus and his body burned and his family told, if you go to the police, we'll kill you. I washed the feet of the martyr's widow. I've, I've been with people who were beaten almost to death and they go back to preach. One of the grads from our, our ministry school a little over two years ago was murdered by Al-Qaeda terrorists as he was doing outreach work in a Muslim country. And he and his wife discussed it. We're willing to die for these people. Left behind a wife and two little children. And, and we can't even discuss the details because we still have team members in there risking their lives for the gospel. My, my point is following Jesus is not a matter of convenience or self-fulfillment. Following Jesus is a matter of here I am, send me, use me. If I live, I live. If I die, I die. If we start there, then we can really find blessing. If we start there, we can find extraordinary fulfillment. If we start there, then we can find out what God really made us for. And our destiny in him is far greater than we would have dreamed up ourselves. Just a, a few quick thoughts on some biblical passages. The whole idea of abomination in, in Leviticus, Toeva, Leviticus 18.22 and 20.13, we're told that there are many things that are called abomination in Leviticus, including food laws. Well, no, actually, the Hebrew word toeva, which means something detestable or abominable, is only found in the book of Leviticus with reference to one specific sin. There's only one sin, one sinful act that is specified in Leviticus as toeva, and that is homosexual practice. There was something fundamentally very wrong about it, and it was the only sin singled out as an abomination that also had the death penalty associated with it. Now, God forbid that we're advocating treatment like that today. That was old covenant. That was a theocracy in Israel, and, and we're under a new and better covenant now. And as much as I get misrepresented about uh, uh, somehow sanctioning some of the, the brutal punishments in, in the Uganda bill, that's never been the case. I'm sympathetic to their situation in many ways, but don't agree with some of the, the sanctions. But what we need to understand is that this was singled out in a very, very strong way in Leviticus as a fundamental violation. And in Leviticus 18, it's in the category of to'evot, which is plural for abominations. And these were sins that the Canaanites and the Egyptians committed, pagans, idol worshipers, because of which God said, I will judge them. In other words, there were things that God gave Israel just for Israel. Food laws, don't mix two kinds of seeds when you're planting, things like that. Things that God gave Israel to keep them separate from the nations. And there were other things that were universal prohibitions, like don't murder. That was a universal prohibition for all people. The prohibition against homosexual practice, and there's no ambiguity in the Hebrew, it's a man lying with a man as one would lie with a woman. The prohibition against homosexual practice is listed along with incest, and bestiality, and other things. This is not my list. This is as listed in Leviticus 18 as a universal moral prohibition for all people. That's why it's reinforced elsewhere in the New Testament. People say, well, what parts of the law are we supposed to keep or not keep? Well, the dietary laws, God said to Israel, Leviticus 11, Deuteronomy 14, these foods are detestable for you. They're not detestable for everybody, but they're detestable for you because I'm keeping you separate from the nations. But you will find homosexual practice emphasized once again in the New Testament as sinful and wrong. And it's interesting. I have it in my book, Can You Be Gay and Christian? But these things are well known to those in the field. There are quite a number of top gay and lesbian scholars, biblical scholars, theologians, who say, oh, of course, the Bible is plainly against homosexual practice. 
and, and then they have another reason either to say, hey, it's bad news, or, well, that was then, but now we're more enlightened. These things have not been debatable, and don't let anyone tell you they really are. We're often asked the question, well, what about Jesus? I mean, Jesus certainly didn't address this. Well, last year when the Duck Dynasty controversy erupted, I had written an article on it that, that started to go viral, as a result of which I ended up on, on Piers Morgan. And it's one of these talking head deals where, where you're just sitting in a room with um, an earpiece with a camera on you, and you're trying to hear, you know, as colleagues here have done many a time, and even as British accents, every little thing can throw you because you, you know, sometimes the connection's not good. So you're listening. When do you jump in and so on? But we got around in this discussion, and Piers Morgan gave me a standard challenge. So I just want you to see the response and then some further interaction with Mark Lamont Hill. Go ahead. There are lots of offensive things in the Bible. But let me ask you this, sir. As a Christian man, can you point to a single public utterance by Jesus Christ the Christ in Christianity about gay people or about a gay lifestyle. Can you name one single thing? Go to Sodom and Gomorrah. Of I'll, 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 name, I'll name three for you, Pierce. Number one, in Matthew 5, Jesus said he didn't come <laughs> to abolish the Torah, but to fulfill. He takes the sexual morals of the Torah to a higher level. Number two, in Matthew 15, he says all sexual acts committed outside of marriage defile the human being. And in Matthew 19, he says, marriage as God intended it is the union of one man and one woman for life. Look, Jesus did not address wife beating or heroin shooting, but we don't uh, use that argument for silence. But in point of fact, he as a first century Jew, of course, he reinforced these things. And Pierce, right. I'd encourage you to restudy what scripture says. We should love our neighbors ourselves, but that doesn't mean that we approve Pierce, everything of our yeah, neighbor. But, but th there, there are several problems Pierce. with that interpretation. One, yeah, yeah, Mount Lamont Hill first. One, one, the New Testament absolutely does uh, offer the words and the voice of Jesus, and he, he very explicitly does not talk about being gay. And even the scripture you cited about marriage is very different than, 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 than talking about being gay. And even if you say that he... Well, marriage is one no, man no, no, and no, one hold, woman, hold, hold, though, hold, sir. Let me, let me finish. I, I heard everything you said. I just want to respond to it. When you say, if you're saying that he's confirming the Old Testament, well, the Old Testament is far from clear around, around gay marriage or around gay acts. The, the story, Are you sure about that? If you let me finish, I'll tell you how I'm sure about it. The book of Leviticus, according to most biblical scholars, is not about being gay. If you talk about the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, for example, it's really about being inhospitable to neighbors. It's about prostitution. It's about many other other things. It's not, Leviticus it's 18. Not, not, uh, Hebrew, scholarship is my, Hebrew scholarship is my background. I have a PhD in Semitic languages. Absolutely, Leviticus 18 is quite explicit. For a man to lie with a man is contrary to what God intended. Right, the rectum the, is the part of the disposal system. It's not meant for sexuality. God designed a man to be with a woman. That's pretty obvious. That's not hateful to say it. That's People, obvious. And, and really, the, the Hebrew there, scriptures there, are clear few, on this, sir. There are few uh, Pierce, biblical Pierce, interpretations. They ended up pretty quickly changing the subject to race after that. <laughs> And of course, the producers are saying, make sure you interrupt, get your point in. So you're, you're trying to do it in a polite way. Uh, but, but again, you, you might as well say that, that Jesus actually endorsed uh, UFO alien impersonators. And how do we know? Because he doesn't say a word about it. So the argument from silence is, is pitifully weak. But again, as a first century Jew, homosexual practice was considered among the worst sins that could be committed. And bear in mind that there were cultures in which Jews lived where it was a way of life or it was celebrated. It was advocated in certain parts of, of Greek culture in the so-called mentoring relationship be, between an older man and say a young teenager and things like that with sexual acts. But these things were considered to be unheard of or terribly wrong in the Jewish community. So for, you know, you could say to me, obviously, uh, you have no problem with the kidnapping of, of the, the children in Nigeria because you haven't talked about that today. Well, that was not the subject matter, but of course, we're, it's universally abhorred by any person of conscience in the world. So the argument from silence is solely tell, totally self-defeating there, but moreover, Jesus in these different ways makes clear that he's reinforcing the biblical values of, of sexual purity and beyond. I uh, read a story one time of a lesbian woman who was going to a gay affirming church and she wanted her partner to go and her partner wouldn't go, wasn't interested in God. Partner finally consented to go and the lesbian pastor gives an altar call for people to come to know Jesus. Again, just want you to understand that some of these things are trickier 
than you might realize, and deception is deeper than we might realize. As someone once said, the problem with deception is that it's very deceiving. <laughs> so this woman responds to the altar call and is genuinely born again as she puts her faith in Jesus and begins to read the scriptures as a result of which she comes under conviction of sin and breaks up the relationship with her lesbian partner. God can move in many, many different ways. And I have no question that there are people struggling and really trying to sort this out before God. I also have no question that there are people who just want to do their thing and live in the flesh. But hey, we have that all over the, the uh, heterosexual couples. We've got enough scandals among heterosexual ministers. I've said many, many times that no-fault divorce in the heterosexual church has done more to undermine marriage than all gay activists combined. I've, I've publicly apologized for the lack of integrity and the lack of purity among so many of our ministers and, and leaders. So we recognize it's sin. We also recognize homosexual practice is sin. And all of us at the foot of the cross recognize Jesus shed the same blood for heterosexual and homosexual alike. And he offers us new life in him. And it begins the same way. Take up your cross, follow him. It begins with a fundamental death to self to the core of our being, and we now live to do the will of God. If your whole identity was to be a drug-using rock star like mine was when I got saved at 16, heroin-shooting, LSD-using, hippie rock drummer, Nancy and I met at the age of 19, two and a half years after I came to faith, so she didn't know me in my drug days. When she saw a picture of me from before I was a believer with my long hair, she started laughing. I said, you're laughing because I look like a woman. She said, no, I'm laughing because you look like an ugly woman. <laughs> Here I was, uh, you know, I wanted to be a rock star. That was my whole life, identity, drugs, rock music. Well, coming to faith in Jesus in a little traditional church, I went from Led Zeppelin, dazed and confused, to blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. I went from Jimi Hendrix, Foxy Lady. I'm in my first concert, Hendrix concert. I saw when I was 13 years old. I went from that and Grateful Dead and The Who to softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Every, it, it, everything had it. And then being Jewish meant that family rejection, and, and if I'd been in a very religious home, it would mean complete rejection and a funeral for me, and I wouldn't exist anymore. And, and that's totally, absolutely minor compared to what others have to do to follow the Lord. So let's get our eyes off self. Let's get our eyes off my identity is, I'm this, I'm that. And let's rather focus on building relationship with God through Jesus. Let's focus on being sons and daughters of God. Let's find our identity in that. And then let's find out what pleases him. Uh, in the book, I do go through the major scriptural arguments. Uh, does the Hebrew word toeva actually refer to moral abominations or just ritual abominations? We explain that. We get further into the teaching of Jesus. We unpack that. And each chapter begins with a sound bite because we have to be tweetable or close to it these days. So a soundbite, here's the argument, and I put gay Christian in quotes not to be offensive because I know there are some that by the first definition, people who renounce their attractions but are still same-sex attracted and follow the Lord, they would say, quote, I'm a gay Christian. I feel it's a bad term to use. I feel it's easily misunderstood, and it puts the emphasis often in, in the wrong place. It starts with I'm gay, etc., cetera, and, and that only leads to a wrong way of, of thinking. But... We go through, here's the, quote, gay Christian argument, soundbite, here's the soundbite, biblical answer, and then break it down. We go through what Paul says, we lay out in Romans 1 how he's clearly saying that acts of man with a man and a woman with a woman are contrary to the natural intended order at creation as laid out in Genesis 1. And the other teachings of Paul, we go through what the Greek words mean categorically and clearly, and, and then really ask, okay, how can we bring this all together? Are we using the Bible to sanction anti-homosexual practice like we use the Bible to sanction slavery and segregation, the oppression of women? We, we explain how it was misusing the Bible that sanctioned slavery and segregation and oppression of women, which is why as Christian leaders, most of these cases were the ones who led the way to bring about change. But we are rightly using the Bible to prohibit homosexual practice. We also indicate that every tree bears fruit after its own kind. What do I mean by that? I mean that... If you will read enough, quote, gay Christian literature, if you'll get the queer Bible commentary of these others, you'll find in them some of the most perverse, imaginable interpretations. You will find people that are regularly quoted as gay theologians or an up-and-coming gay theological voice in the Huffington Post and so on, and 
you'll see if you read enough of their stuff, some of the most shameful, shocking illustrations and interpretations of Scripture. Why? Because ultimately, even though you have many, quote, gay Christians who abhor this stuff, it's what the tree naturally produces because it's built on fundamental theological error. And, and then we, we conclude with, all right, how do we find the balance of grace and truth? How do we walk in a way that is not judgmental in terms of condemning and hypocritical? How do we walk in a way of compassion and truth together? And, and I quote at length from, from those who've done pastoral ministry, those who struggle with same-sex attraction and recognize it as wrong in God's sight. And thankfully, as folks have been reading the book, we're getting great responses in terms of sensitizing of heart and now being equipped to answer these questions. Uh, let me just mention my website is askdrbrown, askdrbrown.org. And every day from 2 to 4 p.m., we do a live talk radio show. In fact, after this lecture today, I'll, I'll be doing one from the, the uh, offices here, live from D.C., uh, but for listening information in the D.C. area and different parts of the country or to listen online or by podcast, just go to the website, askdrbrown.org. And if you go between 2 and 4 Eastern Standard Time, for those watching the webcast, uh, you'll see a banner saying, listen here, and you can just click on your smartphone or tablet or PC if you're not getting it in your city. And for everyone here, we do have copies of the book. Uh, happy to sign those for you if you like. And grab one of these bookmarks on the way out. It's got radio info on the back and, well, I don't know which is the back or the front, but website, radio info. And we have literally hundreds of hours, no, excuse me, thousands of hours of free material on the website. Free audio material, links to video debates and, and other talks. Uh, I write between three and four, sometimes five new articles a week on relevant issues. And, and you'll be able to get, get some of your frustration out by reading the articles because I'm probably saying what you once said, hopefully in a way that articulates things for you. So with that, we've got time for about 10 minutes of questions. There's a mic that's going to be going around. If you have a question, here's the only request because time is short. Uh, we don't need an introduction as to who you are. Uh, we don't need a long preface to the question, but just the simple question if you could answer that, uh, if you could not answer it, I'll try to answer it. If you give the question simply and succinctly, I'll do my best to answer. So if you raise your hand, we will get the mic over to you. We'll start right in the front here. Uh, do you have a distinction between the questions of uh, are you a Christian, are you saved, and related to that? So um, imagine that you have uh, a, pers a gay person who... Uh, has a genuine conversion experience. They're in a church with one of these pastors who thinks it's, who teaches it's okay to be gay. Maybe they've read a lot of those books you mentioned. You know, if, if they were to, to die today, you know, what, what would God's reaction be to that genuine desire to, to follow the teachings of the church and to follow Christ? Sure. I often don't use the term Christian for a couple of reasons. One is a Jewish follower of Jesus. It can sound like an oxymoron to say Jewish Christian. Uh, so I'll often say Jewish follower of Jesus or Messianic Jew, and often the term Christian is either ambiguous or negative, uh, because of which I tend not to use it. However, in simple terms, because people are saying it a certain way, can you be gay and Christian, everyone means the same thing, namely, can you be a genuine follower of Jesus and, and practicing homosexual at the same time? So yes, there are plenty of people in churches that are not Christian. That's been the case with church history. That's one of the first things I learned as a Jewish believer when the rabbi gave me a book on church history was not everyone professing the name of Jesus is, is truly one of his. So if we say, can you be truly born again, truly saved, a true follower of Jesus and practice homosexuality at the same time, the answer is obviously no. However, it doesn't mean that someone in their ignorance or in their infancy or in their early stages of coming to know the Lord may be engaging in wrong aspects of life and may not immediately come under conviction. Uh, some are instantly delivered, some are instantly changed, some for many, many, many years are struggling up and down. And I'm constantly telling churches, listen, we need extraordinary compassion because many people, let's just say there was a lot of sexual activity, so you have sexual addictions added in, Th those can be very hard strongholds to break. Some people are instantly delivered and others back and forth for years and years. And what we need to do is have an environment, number one, where we're not put off when someone comes in, maybe, maybe two guys together and they're holding hands and praising the Lord together. 
I've told our church, be ready for men coming in wearing dresses, and we, we want them to feel welcome and come in. And when your kid says, Daddy, why is the man wearing a dress? Or the Eurovision winner, you know, why is the man in the dress with a beard? Uh, you just say, they're confused. Jesus really loves them. Let's pray for them. And would you willing to go out and have dinner together? You know, reach out. Or are we going to be the church in, in, in that sense? Yes, Jesus constantly reached out to the marginalized and the outcast, but he didn't teach the prostitutes how to be better prostitutes. He changed them. So we reach out to the marginalized and outcast with a message of new life. But let's say a guy comes in and, and maybe he falls 10 times before he takes two steps forward. We just want to be there to love on him and encourage him and root for him as long as they are seeking to move forward. The issue is when I justify my lifestyle, I justify my behavior, I justify my choices, that's the issue. And that's the evidence of lack of repentance. A repentant heart is, I know this is right, I want to please God, I'm struggling, but help me, I know this is right, and I renounce that which is wrong. Uh, question... Oh, in the back over there. Thank you. Uh, I have a couple in my neighborhood. I had given Christmas gifts to everyone, and it's a gay couple. They were the only people that wrote me a card, a thank you, and have done other things. And I have small kids. I want to invest in their life, but I don't want them to think, you know, I'm for their lifestyle. You know, it's a tough situation, so I just didn't know what kind of things I could do to show God's love, but not really bring that spirit into the home either, or, you know, just be sensitive about absolutely. with small kids around. Right, right, Ab absolutely. And, and you're not saying that, you know, this couple is going to come and, you know, you have dinner with them and they start making out at the table. No one's thinking that. It's just if they're interacting as a couple and the kids are confused, etc. Well, first thing is there are all kinds of ways to reach out, and they know that you know that they're a gay couple. Uh, and they know that you're reaching out. So sometimes to just be a friend, and sometimes to just say, hey, I'm a follower of Jesus, I go to this neat church if you ever want to come, and then just reach out. And they say, well, what, what does your church think about this? You know, they, they may ask you, say, well, we believe this, 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 but I want you to know I care for you, and I'm your neighbor and your friend, and, and then you just keep building that relationship. And the issue is not their homosexuality. Their issue is they need to know the Lord. And often we focus on the wrong thing. Uh, you know, I, I tell parents that, let's say your kid comes out, raised in the faith, and they, they haven't been sexually abused, you can't figure out what the cause of these things, you know, and they, uh, Dad, I'm born this way, that's what they, you know, they think now, that's what they're indoctrinated through the media, and they tell you as Christian parents, I say to them, listen, tell, tell them, listen, you know what we believe, you know that we believe homosexual practice is sin. And then just love on them. Say, we're, you're, you're our kid, just the same. We're, we're your mom and dad. We love you. We want to be absolutely involved in your life. If there's an issue, we want, we want to be the ones that you can come to. If you're in pain, struggling, whatever's going on, we love you just the same, and we're going to be praying. You don't need to tell them every day, you know, you know we believe, because that's hanging over their head anyhow. And it's probably exaggerated in their minds. So sometimes, uh, not saying anything, I had a long talk with a gay guy one, one time, a, a high school principal, uh, on a flight, and we talked about, about an hour and a half on the flight, and at the end, because we were talking about all these issues, he said, well, you realize the man sitting next to you is gay? I said, yeah, I knew that from the first moment. <laughs> that's why we've been talking, and that's what, because everything in my speech to him was just compassionate, reaching out, seeking to understand. As, as far as exposure with the kids, if your kids are the type that understand some people are confused, and they really need the Lord, and and they're able to, to, to handle that, fine. If they're impressionable in a way that it's not helpful, then you just do the reaching out there. Every family setting is different. Uh, yes, we've got time for one or two quick questions. Go ahead. I've got, I've got a few, but real quickly, uh, how do you, what do you say to people who say that um, uh, Paul, what Paul said in Romans 1 is Jesus didn't say that, and do you, think, do you think that homosexuality is like drug addiction or alcoholism and, and you know, they're helpless? to? So to answer the second question first, um, in terms of homosexuality, drug addiction, alcoholism, if you practice anything, if you give yourself to it, it can be life controlling. The scripture just says that about many different sins. So it can be life controlling. Look, there are people who are hoarders. 
you know, and, and they can't, they cannot break the habit. People are addicted to gambling and they lose everything over it. So you can give yourself to almost anything and it becomes life controlling. The same thing with homosexual practice. However, there are dynamics to sexual union, especially forbidden sexual union, that can have an even greater hold on someone's life where, where getting free can, can be more costly or deep in their own lives in, in terms of coming to the Lord and, and, and getting ministered to. Um, as far as a comparison with alcoholism, uh, you could say that certain people are predisposed to be alcoholics, but it's still a choice that is made. Certain people may be predisposed to be more sensitive, you know, a boy that's more sensitive and have certain characteristics, which in the wrong environment will have a better chance of becoming homosexual. Uh, but that would be the extent of that comparison. As far as uh, Paul writing things, if anyone believes the authority of Scripture, then what Paul says is just as strong anyhow. Um, and as, as we pointed out, Jesus reinforces these basic moral beliefs as well. Uh, the idea that Paul was not condemning monogamous, same-sex committed relationships, uh, and, and that can be exaggerated as well. Dan Savage, gay activist and sex columnist, advocates being monogamish, uh, and he and his partner said that since they've come together as a committed couple, as of, what, a couple years ago, they already had nine different sexual partners, and that's, that's monogamish. Uh, so you, you have, especially with many gay men, quote, open relationships. So monogamy can even mean something different there. But, but Paul is clearly referring to the sexual union as forbidden and sinful and contrary to God's order. There, there's no two ways around that uh, when read honestly and openly. And no one would have ever dreamed of these other interpretations. That's what you always have to ask. With biblical scholarship as my field, you have to say, if, if nobody ever saw this before, all the biblical scholars in the world, and, and some have radical, crazy interpretations. Many don't believe in Scripture at all. If nobody ever came up with this before, and it's just being discovered now in harmony with new aspects of sexual expression, and it just happens to affirm those new aspects of sexual expression, something's wrong somewhere on that fundamental level. All right. Um, we, we'll, have, we have actually run out of time. We have run out of time. Let's all thank Dr. Brown. All right. Thank you very much.